those who are here in person, and all our friends in the virtual land. We also welcome you back our Reverend Dr. Grace Zamir. May God bless you all.
How many of you know that the Lord can fix every problem that you have? If you believe it, say amen.
Let the people of Zion be glad in their King. Let them praise His name with dancing and make music to Him with tremble and harp. For the Lord takes delight in His people. He crowns the humble with victory. Let His faithful people rejoice in this honor and sing for joy on their beds. May the praise of God be in their mouth and a double-edged sword in their hands to inflict vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples. To bind their kings with fetters, their nobles with shackles of iron. To carry out the sentence written against them. This is the glory of all his faithful people. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus all of my trials I cannot bear these burdens alone in my
Jesus because he's the only one who can help me out. Our second scripture is coming from the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 18, verse 1 to verse 8. And this can be found on page 76 of your few Bible. Please let us hear the word of truth. Then Jesus told them a parable about the need to pray always and not to lose heart, he said. In a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused. But later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice, so that she may not wear me out by continuing coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the, new, the unjust judge says, and will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the word of the Lord. Father, gracious God, I ask for your name. I ask for your word to me. I pray with my people that you will give me the word to speak and use me as a way to message to our children. In Jesus' name, Amen. Trust in God. So the son said to his father, Daddy, when are we going to the ball game? He promised we would go. Yes, son. I promise we will go. I told you. We will go, we'll go. Then the wife came along and said to her husband, honey, I've tried to tell you for a long time that we are in trouble. And I've tried to tell you that we need to make the changes you said we would make. You promised that you will do that, right? You said a long time ago, Nothing has been done. The husband didn't lie. I know, honey. I promise. I told you I would. And I will. Most of us, at one time or another in our lives, have hung on the edge of a promise delay. We have waited and waited and waited some more for the fulfillment of something that has been promised to us. And you know, as well as, 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 well as I do, that the longer we wait, the longer the delay in the fulfillment of the promise. The more we begin to consider that the promise won't be kept at all. Because as soon as a promise is made, that is created within us an expectation of fulfillment. It's painful to wait for what's been promised, but not fulfilled. And so when a promise deeply hoped for is delayed, it's easy to lose faith in the one 
It's easy to lose confidence in that person. Easy to lose trust in that person's word. And sometimes the relationship becomes a strange if it even survives. But what if the one who made the promise, if the one who made the promise has been long, that that's been long delayed, is God. What if someone begins to lose faith in God? What happens when God's confidence is called into question? When someone begins to lose trust in God's word? What if someone becomes disheartened, disheartened toward God to the point where he loses faith? If it's painful because of a delayed promise to be estranged from a mother, a father, a sister, a brother, or even a friend or spouse, how much more painful must it be to be estranged from the one who created us. That's the very situation in our passage this morning. Luke is writing to this church, his own church, several generations after the life and death of Jesus Christ. And from the earliest times that Jesus followers had tried to make sense of his life, birth, death, and resurrection, and even ascension, they had hung on the delicious promise that Jesus would come back, and they expected his return forthcoming. Yes, my sister Jesus. And the longer they waited for his return, and the wise seeking to be faithful to what he had taught them, the more they experienced despair at the delay of the promise. And not only were they experiencing despair and the delay, some were also experiencing suffering and abuse. People were strengthened to face suffering and abuse because the promise that Jesus would return never came. And if and if it is as if they began to say, this will never happen. How long should we wait? How long will Jesus come? You can only ask people to hang on to hang in there for just so long. And after a while, a promise delay feels just like a promise betrayed. And that's why Luke tells us in the verses that introduces the parable today, that Jesus told this parable so that people would not lose heart. And so the parable of the widow and the unjust judge is not so much a parable on how to pray as it is a parable on trust in God to grant justice and to bring vindication to God's people. People in Luke's, in Luke's community were beginning to say, we've been waiting for such a long time and it will never happen. And by means of this, as this strange parable, Luke reminds his community that God keeps God's promises. That the day is surely coming. And coming is speedy. When God will grant justice to God's people. So the woman in the, in the parable is a widow. This is not worthy and a common topic in the Hebrew scripture because it is people particularly, 
particular those in authority to fulfill God's own purposes to people like widows and orphans. What matters here is that she is among those whom any respectable judge will be seriously obliged to help. But as you notice in the passage, this judge is different. This is no respectable judge. Jesus points out that this judge neither fears God nor has any respect for human beings. Not even a deserving widow is going to get a good hearing from him. But this is no ordinary widow. This woman is bold. She's bossy. She keeps demanding. She's not asking. She's demanding her justice. Even though her chances to success are little and now. She's saying to the judge, I'm not here until you give me justice. Grant me justice. And she doesn't go one time. She goes, she goes to the judge multiple times. And for a while, the judge refuses. He doesn't even look at her. But finally, he relents, saying, I have no fear of God. I have no respect for anyone. But OMG, I'm going to do what this woman asks. Because she keeps bothering me. Because she keeps coming. And she keeps wearing me out. So I'm just going to do it. So the Greek word translated, wear me out, literally means to strap, to strike under the eye, or to give a black eye. What the judge was actually saying to this woman was that this woman is so bossy, she's so opposite, that if she's going to give me a black eye if I don't give her what she wants. This is what the judge was afraid of. So he decided to grant her justice. And why the judge doesn't care about anybody else? I can bet you he cares what everyone, everyone else thinks about him. And so in order to avoid the black eye, he gives justice to the woman. Now this parable is not a tale. It's not like a crusty judge who doesn't care. The form of the parable is from lesser to greater. If a judge who does not care will do this for a widow, then how much more will God, who loves justice and cares so much for his people, will do for us? So look means to say to his church, you are in danger of becoming disheartened in the face of a delayed promise. But don't lose heart, don't lose faith, trust in God, be confident in God. God is faithful and God will surely return. Wait for the Lord and trust in Him not despairing. Why do you think scripture is so filled with images on waiting upon God? Why do you think we stand on the pulpit every Sunday to say the Lord is coming back? Why do you think there are churches open every Sunday even when it's raining? And preachers are there preaching the word of God. It's because we want people not to live in despair. We don't want people to give up. 
but to wait patiently for the authentic one. It is to tell you guys not to abandon your faith, not to abandon your hope, and wait on this God. So there was this man who, whose name was Isaac, and he was working in a, construct, a construction building company, a huge one. He always complained how he was able to build all these beautiful boats, but couldn't even afford one for his wife and his children. And, and he decided maybe I, I have to start praying. So he started praying, asking God to help him win the lottery. So he would finally afford to get the boat he had so promised to his wife and his children. So he worked tirelessly until two weeks before his retirement, but never won the lottery. So two weeks before he went to see his boss and said, you know, I'm leaving in two weeks. I'm tired of working here, and I don't even have a boat under my name. What am I doing? I've been praying to this God. He never replies. I give up. And so the boss said, you know, I understand you living in two weeks, but please give me two extra weeks because there is this boat I want you to build for me. It will be your last boat here. But please do it for me. Isaac said, okay, would I be compensated? He said, yeah, I'll pay you. And so Isaac started working on this board. But Isaac, energy, eagerness, the devotion that he had when he was building other boards was not there. He was lacking that. And he said, you know, I don't even care. I'm just building this boat for my boss. I'm just doing the usual job. And I'm going to get paid. So Isaac completed the job two days before the two weeks, the one month extension, the two weeks extension after the two weeks of his assignment. He went to see his boss. He said, I'm done. His boss said, Isaac, I don't see your touch on this board. It looks just like any other board. Where is your confidence, Isaac? Where is your energy? Put something in this board that will make me remember you when you are gone. Isaac, please do something. Isaac is like, I'm telling you, I did everything that I could. So the boss said, OK. Since you are done, I have to pay. The boss paid him for the two extra weeks. And he said, I'm also giving you the boat you last paid. It wasn't my boat. It was yours. Isaac was so mad. Isaac was so disappointed. He was like, if I knew, if I only knew that this was my boat, I would have put the best touch. I would have put the best painting. I would have done the best that I could. But Isaac missed out the, on the, the, the point of his work. He was so disappointed. He was so, he had given up so a long time ago that he didn't care what he was doing after that. And so, friends, this morning, Luke is saying to us, do not be like Isaac. Do not abandon your hopes and trust in God. But Luke is also saying to us, in the face of a delayed promise, pray like this bold and bossy widow who was, she was already about to give a black eye to this judge. Pray boldly, confidently, without ceasing. Don't pray like Isaac and say, you know what, I'm tired. I'm not going to do the best.
place that I could. And look at how Jesus concludes the parable. He concludes this parable with a question. When the Son of Man does come, will he find faith on earth? Will our souls still be alive in God? In spite of the promises delay, or will he find us having given up or caved in? Let's pray a bit. But the disciples of Jesus Christ, those who have been taught to pray as he prayed, like this bossy, confident, uppity widow, who demanded justice from a crooked judge? Ask Jesus to still teach them, teach them how to pray. And this was Jesus' response. His response. Years ago in Illinois, a young man with six months schooling to his credit ran for an office as my had been expect, expected, he was beaten. Next, he entered business, but fell in that too. And spent the next 17 years paying the debt of his worthless partner. He fell in love with a charming lady and became engaged. And she died. He had a nervous breakdown. He ran for Congress and was defeated. He then, he then tried to obtain an appointment to the U.S. Land Office, but he didn't succeed. He became a candidate for the vice presidency and lost. Two years later, he was defeated for Senate. He ran for office one small time and was elected. That man was Abraham Lincoln the president of the U.S. See, friends, it took Winston Churchill three years to get to the eighth grade because he couldn't pass English of all things. Unlucky, he was asked many years later to give a commencement speech at Oxford University. He's now famous speech consisted on only three words. Never give up. Never give up in the face of adversity. Amen. Who 
concluding our dead worship service today, but wanted to be here because of an illness. Those of us who are still working hard and trying to trust and believe in his promise of Jesus' return. Please, let us go to God. Thy will be done 
on earth as it is. Give us this day. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. From thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.